All right. Uh, while, you know, feel free to go grab some pizzas. I'll go and get started here and introduce uh, today's talk and the session. I do apologize. I'm a little late, and I don't know why I'm not getting feedback. There you go. So, welcome to the 2014 uh, first Hack Formers meeting. I'll talk a little bit about uh, who we are for, because I see a few new faces here, and uh, in a moment I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, who we are, we're actually hackers or information security professionals, and that's where the word hack comes from. And we are transformers as in commissioned Christians. So, uh, hack formers are Christians uh, as hackers, or hackers as Christians. Uh, the mission is what we do is to teach security and to teach Christ. But the eventual uh, objective is to teach security that is in Christ. Um, all right. Who we are not, uh, for the benefit of those who are first time over here, we're not actually a security organization with Christian objectives. We're a Christian organization with security objectives. Having said that, uh, we've been told that sometimes we've, we've been divisive on faith, but that is not the intent. We're actually not competing with any local interest groups, no local security groups. We're inclusive of all and uh, making sure that we support each other, like OWASP, ISSA, AHA, and every other meetings that we have over here in the great state of Texas, or the great country of Texas, as my son puts it, right, and uh, in the city of Austin. Uh, we're not competing with any local churches as well. We're actually augmenting the churches and the other groups that are out here. The way we operate is we have monthly educational meetings like we have this one. Uh, speakers present on an information security topic, generally, and then you draw a parallel from the scripture. I'll give you an example in a minute. And then in the last part of the meeting, we actually discuss as to how that actually applies to our personal and, and professional lives. Uh, so last uh, talk that was given was on backdoor threats against software and against your soul uh, from the Kali operating system. We looked at some of the web scripts and things that are there that we could use uh, uh, to demonstrate backdoors. And backdoor threats use covert channels. And from the analogy that we draw from the scripture is he who enters not by the door, right, but uh, is, is a thief and a robber. And Jesus said that I am the way, the door, the, the, the life. And he came to give life and not to, to, to steal life. How this actually applies to us, backdoor threats require different types of controls, so there's the patching aspect to it, uh, exploitation defense, monitoring aspect to it so that you check to make sure that there are no scripts or no covert channels established, and then removal or, of, the, of the script or the backdoor itself. In the same way, in terms of how it applies to our personal lives, we patch our lives with the Holy Spirit or with the, with the Holy Spirit of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, we watch and pray or be on guard so we don't, you know, monitor monitoring ourselves so we don't fall prey, and we repent in terms of removing the sins that is in us. Uh, we operate quite a bit on Tweet, tweet uh, using that Hackformers uh, handle, and then the blog site that is there. So some of the resources, there's, there are some Bibles in the back. If you don't have one and you need one, feel free to take one. Uh, the website, you can actually subscribe also on the website if you're not already subscribed so that you get immediately any time a post is made or any updates are made, you get, get that information through emails. There's a LinkedIn group that's not as active. Twitter is very active. Who is not a follower? So if you're a Twitter, you know, if you're a tweet, if you're a Twitter junkie or somebody who's so like, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, we're saying follow Hackformers as we follow Christ, right? So, um, at Hackformers is the, the thing. There's a store, there's stickers and business cards that I have. You guys can actually get some really cool swags, like, uh, you know, these stickers over here, um, Hackformers, Hackformers stuff that you could add on to your, to your electronic paraphernalia and other stuff. So there's some business cards as well that you could take without the name printed. So if you want to give away that, you could actually add your name and give it. Uh, meet me after the after the talk, and, and you should be able to get some. There's a platform of stores for those who are interested to get some swags. Then feel free to go. We don't actually make any money out of it. It's at cost to us. We just give the the logo of ours and and the organization that does it for OAS. There's the, there's the same company that does it for us as well. So they have it up there, and it's available for you to be able to purchase. Um, at your own free will. Uh, my son was asking for some, so I asked them to put some huge sizes and you know, child sizes t-shirts are available as well. Now here's the important part, uh, how can you actually get involved? Pray uh, for the organization, that's a big thing that you could do. Participate in terms of time, we have volunteers that are much needed for, for many things like uh, you know, from social media to website to promoting Hackformers. I'm going to actually put Matt on the spot and ask him to quickly give an update on what he's been doing. He volunteered last week, last year to help out with all of the video recording and if you can quickly just share as to what he does and how, how it helps us and then also if there's any needs that he could share. With sure, us. yeah. Uh, so uh, there was a need for the uh, meetings to be recorded for people who aren't able to attend on a regular basis or who want to attend globally. So, And we'd like to make those available internationally. So we uh, set up a YouTube channel and we've been...
playing around with, with, with recording them. There's a few of them up there. If you go to YouTube slash Hackformers, you'll find the videos up there. And uh, for the last few weeks, not the last one, I'm still, I am not a video expert by any means. I can convert them, but I'm, I'm still learning how to uh, overlay presentations with video. So if any of you are experts and want to be involved, I would love to get your, your help, and we would all really appreciate that. That's what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And not that Jason is not on the web, in the web world, but uh, this talk will also get on that channel. So, you know, youtube.com at farmers, if it's okay with you. Uh, I'm also going to pass. Uh, Okay. <laughs> That's okay. In terms of tithes, essentially what we're, all, what we're asking is to support your churches and the other organizations you work with, um, you know, the charity organizations. Uh, if you're led to actually sponsor one of the food for one of the meetings, then we actually have been doing it for, for the past year. I'll pass this as a sign-up sheet. It basically is, uh, uh, it, it comes to, it has like a speaker who's potentially going to be there or has been, or has been confirmed, uh, your name and then contact information so we can reach you. The way it works is we're not set up as an organization to receive any donations, and so in that regard, all we want you to do is directly work with the restaurant of your choice, and it's about 50 to $60 on an average per, per meeting that we've been having over here. So you can actually work directly with your, uh, organization, uh, with your restaurant of your choice, and so if you want to sign up, then feel free to. You're not obliged to, but take time if you want to. And then if you have talents to speak or help with the organization, then let us know as well. Right? What's the status of the 501c? Oh, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. All right? Uh, announcements, monthly meetings, we have monthly meetings over here. It's the first Friday every month, except for a few months, like on July 4th weekend, since it usually falls around a Friday, we, we postpone that. So except on July and a few other months, we, if there's some like Memorial Day or things that fall on the first week, then we would, uh, or Labor Day, we would, we would actually move that meeting. <coughs> Uh, it's 11.30 to 1 in this building. Upcoming meetings, record the dates, February 7th and March 7th. should be easy for you to be able to uh, look at. In fact, for this year, we have a good lineup of speakers that we're targeting. Marianne is later in the month. Than yes. 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 So Marianne is actually, so Jason is here. Next, next month, we're trying to target Kevin Johnson, who is a SANS instructor, and he's, a, he's very well known in terms of uh, the stuff that he does with Secure Ideas. Then we have Mary Ann Davidson, who's the CIS of Oracle, expected to be here in March. Uh, and then Jim O'Gorman, who, is, who goes as Elwood, uh, or the, the president of Offensive Security, he's going to be, he's targeted to be here in April. Uh, and then we have a lineup of other speakers, like Stephen Northcutt, the president of SANS, and, and uh, Michael Farnham, who is, you know, HUSECCON's founder, organizer. Uh, Dave Kennedy, you guys know, he was here, he did a one-day training for free last uh, year and filled up this room so on social engineering techniques or toolkit. Uh, he most likely will be back again here this year. And then Michael Howard from, from you know, some good large, large names we're targeting. The reason why we put these guys are because they also believe and they represent a much greater God than themselves. Uh, yeah, so. right. And uh, in terms of hackers <coughs> organization, the update I have to give you is quick. Uh, Microsoft Facilities contract was renewed for, but they changed their policy. We actually had a one-year renewal for being able to use this facility, but they said it's only by three months we can do. So we, I've got only confirmation for surety for the next three months. Uh, but in that statement, we also had to put as to what uh, hack commerce is, and I put it what we, are, we originally put that we are a Christian organization with faith-based organization with security, and we talk about security in our meetings. Uh, that could come under question, is what I'm told. So if that does come under question, we may be kicked out of this place. <laughs> uh, if we do, then I want you to pray about it and see if you have other places that you would recommend. But till March, we are good. But following March, you know, we may be like the Israelites wandering <laughs> for, for a couple of years. <laughs> we don't know. So, so that's just an update and a prayer request. Uh, there has been interest generated for local chapter hack former groups in different states, uh, California, Florida, and other places. Uh, so we don't know how to go about doing it, but we were told that it's best to actually start to form an entity. So we went ahead and filed for some of the entity formation. I'm going to pull Richard on the spot and ask him to give a quick update on... Uh, on where we are in that process and what that means to the organization, why that is beneficial to us to form an entity itself. Sure, so um, <clears throat> let's see, where do we start? Um, with regards to creating an entity, it's important for us, right, you know, fiscally. Uh, we've got to be able to handle the tax implications of handling donations and <coughs> be able to give everybody a chance to be able to receive a receipt. So they can go ahead and you know count that on their IRS taxes at the end of the year. Um, it's it's a little bit of a complicated process. It's a two-step process. The first part of the process is registering as an entity with the state. So we had to decide what kind of entity we were going to be, how it was going to be formed.
form and then incorporate under the state uh, provisions. But the state provision, when you incorporate, you have to have the federal provisions kind of put in there in your um, in your articles of incorporation. And also, there's a lot of work to be done you know, with regards to creating an entity. So we've got most of that work already done, and we've filed with the state, right? So it's been processed with the state, so as far as I can tell, we are now an official entity with the state, so the next step is to get our 5013C status. So I shouldn't, I would expect that that's gonna get done sometime this month in January, or at least we can submit it in January, and then you know, who, who knows how long it's gonna take with the federal government. I wouldn't expect any more than three to five weeks, I guess. Yeah, so we're almost there. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. Yeah, Rich has been helping with that process, and thank you so much. He had some background and experience, so he offered to jump in and help. So, so thank you so very much for helping with that. Unless our paperwork gets stuck somewhere in Bridgegate, like New Jersey, I think we'll be. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we don't try and register as a Republican organization, I think we're fine. We should be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that said, I'm actually super excited for two reasons. One is we have a uh, we have a great guy and a dynamic speaker, uh, Jason Street, who's actually taken the time to drive all the way from Oklahoma, and um, and um, so I'm very happy to have him. He's a good friend. Um, he's known for having created this fad in the security industry called Awkward Hugs. So if you don't know Jason or you've not heard about Awkward Hugs, then check it out while you're in the, talk, in the while he's talking or so. And then he has pro he's offered that there are chances that he may give get an awkward hug from you, or he may give you an awkward hug. And usually, if he does that, he then takes pictures and then he blasts your name all over the place. <laughs> right? so, so, so that so excited about that. And then also, secondly, this is our two-year mark. We started in February 10, the February 6th of 2012, and this is our two-year mark. So we're thankful to God for having led us for the last two years. And looking forward to a great 2014 season. And next meeting, uh, I'll kind of probably put together a summary of what has happened since the past two years and what we need to do and put that up on our blogs and all that stuff. So with that, with that I don't want to steal his thunder. He's going to come and introduce himself. And uh, Jason Street, you the floor is yours. are like wondering like man I wonder what this talk's gonna be about. So do I. <laughs> this is honestly going to be a um, what I did for this talk that's not working. What I did um, for this was I took part of a talk that I'm still working on that I'm gonna do this year on uh, hacking culture. It's like a I've traveled, I've circumvented the earth twice, I've gone to hacking conferences from all over the world and stuff, you know, and all, all the different continents except for Australia, I'm still trying to get there. Um, and what I wanted to do is I gave a talk on how the hacking cultures are supposed to be different, it's like and how each region is different, and, and I found out like how similar they are. And I also started talking about our, our hacking history, and I talk about what we can do and stuff, you know, to change the perception of hackers. So I was thinking, it's like when I was asked to do this talk, it's like to take the middle part of this talk that I'm giving about the hacking perception, and so and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, so that's what this talk is. Okay. Sorry, guys, it's been a long, long day. Hold on. Oops. Okay. Got to answer. Hey, Dave, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Not much. I'm in the middle of uh, giving a talk at the Hack Formers meeting, but since I interrupted you on Bloomberg or Reuters or something like that, I was like, uh, I'll let you interrupt me. Bloomberg. <laughs> <laughs> so say hello to everybody. Austin, when he's coming. Uh, Dave says hello to everybody. Hello. 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 He wishes he could be there. Uh, okay, well, I, yeah, I'll talk to you later. Thanks a lot, man. Come on. Okay, let me get that vibrate now. It's like, um, sorry. I, I've never claimed to be professional. Um, so what this talk is going to be about is uh, perceptions. It's like how hackers are perceived and how Christians are perceived. And my base is on it. Uh, who I am, usually I'll, I'll talk about I've done this, I've done that. It's like the only thing you need to know about me, especially when it comes into relation to this, is I'm a bad guy. I'm a sinner. It's like I was a horrible person when I was younger and stuff, you know. It's like... Uh, not a very nice person to be around and stuff, you know, and I didn't like to be around me, but I was sort of stuck with it. Uh, so it's like, uh, but I was a sinner. I was one, exactly the guy that Jesus hung out with. 
It's like, and that's how I got my faith, and that's how I was saved and stuff, you know. I am still imperfect. I am a hypocrite, and I am a sinner and stuff, you know. The only difference is that I'm redeemed now. And so, and like I, like I tell my wife when I tell her something she doesn't like and stuff, you know, it's like, well, at least I'm honest about it. She says, yeah, but you're still a jerk. I says, but at least I'm an honest jerk. So, so I am not putting on any kind of airs except for who I am. Uh, also, uh, one key thing is I'm not Baptist or Methodist or Lutheran or Catholic. I'm a Christian. It's like I, I'm very non-religious. It's like I'm very Christian. And I don't speak for any other faith but my experience and how I've lived. So it's like I'm not trying to speak for anybody else. This was a great quote from Russ Rogers when I was doing my um, talk, uh, getting the talk. I sent out questionnaires to people from all over the world and stuff, you know, and I gave this to Russ Rogers, and he filled out the quote. And I said, and at the very end, I said, is there anything else you'd like me to know? And it was like, and he wrote, I like tacos. That means all hackers like tacos, right? It's like, and basically what that means is I'm only speaking from my perceptions and what I say. I can't speak for all the other hackers out there. I can't speak for all the other Christians out there. I can only talk about my path and how I followed it and, and, how, and how, where it's led me. So this is the part about the, uh, the talk that I'm doing this year, is we have a problem and a misconception when it comes to hackers. It's like, uh, and it's, it's something that we like, when you talk about what, what is the, the oldest hacker that you know of? And a lot of people are going to say the Morris Worm, Loft Heavy Industries, Cult of Dead Cows. Like, it's like, but do you know there's some other hackers out there that did some pretty cool stuff and that they were out there? It's like one of them is this guy right here, uh, Alan Turin, uh, the guy in the tie on the left, the less creepier one. Uh, it's like Alan Turin <laughs> was a, a cryptologist. It's like he helped save uh, Britain and stuff during World War II by decoding the Enigma machine. He was an awesome hacker. Except, you know, he was also reviled in his time because of his lifestyle. It's like, and to the point where he was hounded to the point where he committed suicide by eating a cyanide apple because he likes Snow White and stuff. It's like, so that's how he died. And it's like, and he chose his death that way. It's like, and, but now, later, he's gotten pardoned by the British government. Now he's realized for all his work. Now he's lauded for what he's done. But he wasn't really understood in the time that he was there. Now, if you go to the far right, you see Nikola Tesla. Tesla was another genius. The, the tragedy of Tesla is that we have no knowledge of half the things that he did because he was so secretive and he didn't take the notes. He created so many wonderful inventions and had so many different ideas that he just didn't share. And that's a tragedy. It's like also his death was a tragedy. It's like he died in a hotel in New York City. The maid found him two or three days later. No one really cared about him. His biggest love in his life was a white pigeon that he saved at the park. That was his. That was his, the love of his life. Was that white pigeon? He would spend money on uh, rescuing pigeons and stuff in the park. He would walk around a building three times before he entered it. So he has some OCD. He was like, you know, just most hackers around that I know of. So you know, got a little issues and stuff. You know, it's all good. <laughs> and in the middle, of course, is Ada Lovelace. I love people when they talk about women and technology and stuff, you know, they make it sound like women are getting into technology. Say, excuse me, gentlemen. It's like women started this technology in this field and stuff, you know, they led us into it. It's like Ada Lovelace was the first programmer in existence. She started programming. She started the computer computation. She started those algorithms. This all comes from her. It's like, and once again, she was misinformed and stuff, you know, and mislabeled and stuff, you know, and she didn't, you know, end very well either, but it was mostly from cancer and really stupid doctors back then. But she still had a lot of controversy in her life and stuff, you know, and she really wasn't understood for what she accomplished. It wasn't until later that she was accomplished and she was, she was lauded for that. So it's like, see the, the trend and stuff, you know, of where I'm going at. I mean, I was going to mention Leonardo da Vinci and stuff, you know, but then I go into more research to him and say, you know, he was an uber hacker. He was not one of the greatest hackers. But everybody liked him. He was a pretty good guy and stuff, you know, and he died really well and stuff in a nice mansion that a king gave him and stuff, you know. So he didn't fit my narrative, so I didn't put him in here, okay? <laughs> so let's just go with the tragedies and stuff and the misunderstood hackers. But that's what they are. These are misunderstood hackers. This is not new to us and stuff, you know, even though it seems like that because that's what the press likes to present. They like to present us as being something new and something dangerous and something unknown. We're the unknown hackers in a, under on a keyboard and stuff. You know, why are your computer rooms so cold that you have to have a hoodie and a ski mask on? Seriously, 
I just don't understand that. And I would like to say that these guys are idiots and stuff, you know, for representing us that. But quite frankly, sometimes we do it to ourselves. Seriously, that's the, that's the image you want to project. It's like, because they didn't have enough bad images of us. You had to get, the stock photo didn't have enough photos of those guys, right? They decided to post for them some themselves. I'm not going to make too much fun of them because they're probably Mossad and they'd kill me. But, um, <laughs> but still, it's like, I mean, that's just ridiculous and stuff, you know? That's just ridiculous the way that they per per uh, per yeah, that What's that word? Perpetuity? That, you know, perpetuate. There we go. Still waking up, needs more diversity. They perpetuate that cycle of this is what hackers are. Guy's so proud of me, thank you. It's like, so, I mean, but that's what happens. It's like, this is the perfect example, and I've got to look over here because I can't see it all the way. I love this. This was from DerbyCon, a uh, news reporter, Sterling Riggs, WDRB, total jerk, horrible person. I don't like him, and I'm honest about that. Uh, he writes, uh, I don't know how I feel about this DerbyCon happening at the Hyatt downtown. It's a convention for computer hackers. Sessions include password cracking, hacker war games, and a lockpicking pavilion. Thoughts? I'm sure that's the way he said it, okay? It's like I'm just... Iterating. It's like you can't understand. It. But I'm inferring that's probably how he said it. And there were some very great intelligent comments and stuff, you know, when it first came out online. Um, the LMPD and FBI should raid the convention and arrest the people who are doing the training. <laughs> scary. This must be a shock, scary, I don't know what's going on face. It's like what she does because she must have been speechless. It's like, I bet no arrest. More like employment opportunities, hopefully. Uh, wow, that's insane. No, this threat is. Uh, what about classes on mugging and car theft and everything? Because that's totally logical. And the guy's like, and Brenda's like, well, of course, Sean, that's next week. And Amber just summed it up, you know, misspelling and all. I think it is stupid. It's like, and then Jen, Jen, I, I can literally hear her sharpening a pitchfork with, arrest them all. You know, it's like lighting up the torches and stuff, you know. And it's like, and it goes wrong, just wrong. Cops should be waiting to arrest anyone upon their arrival. It, it gets worse, okay? But then Adrian Crenshaw, Iron Geek, decided to go and put out on Twitter this, this link to this post going, hey guys, why don't the hackers comment? And guess what? Hackers commented with logical, well-rounded ideas and arguments and debating topics and stuff about why it's real, why it's good, why it's helpful and informative. Very, there was a couple posts that were like, you know, crazy. Okay, I mean, come on, we're hackers, okay? I'm not, I'm not saying we're all good and stuff, you know, we're all like very nice and logical and like, that was nice, but I would like to point out this and say some of them were like, no, you know, dying a fire, you know, WTF. But, but most of them were good, okay? So what did they do when all these hackers started giving logical responses and started informing the public? They did the only thing they could do. They deleted that post. Those are the only screenshots available from that thread. Is it? Yes. I happened to take it because I was taking it for this talk. That's the only reason why there's a copy of it, because I took those screenshots right when it started. Yeah, it's like, because, like it no, it's gone. Like no, it's gone. gone. They deleted the post as soon as we started getting all these comments and started um, going into the favor of the hackers. The, the radio station, deleted, uh, the TV station deleted it. Because, you know, that's, that's logical. But guess what? You're wrong. I like to say that every once in a while because it's like, wow, how dare you? Because guess what? Who knows about the crazy McDonald's lady? Everybody. Everybody knows about that crazy McDonald's lady. The reason why the cup's got to say it's hot now. Don't we all think she's idiotic and horrible and stuff? You know that she would do that? We're wrong. We were lied to and we were misrepresented to about her. We were told, and actually there's a, uh, there's a link here that I'll actually talk about it because there's a documentary now on it where you actually see where the story changes and the reporter misrepresented something that happened, a key fact, and then it derailed and it just totally went to what you know now. This lady was in her car. It's like uh, she didn't burn herself. It's like she was in her car, stationary, a passenger in a parked car when she spilled the coffee. She didn't scald her hand, people. Her hand wasn't called it, and I apologize, but I think it's appropriate. She burned over 16% of her body with third-degree burns. They had to get a skin graft to repair the damage. They served the coffee at 180 to 190 degree Fahrenheit, 
when they served it because that was the optimal temperature. They decided to offer her $800 for her trouble. She refused that. I think all these people highlighted in pink probably uh, 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 took it. All those people in pink were emergency room admittance for scalded coffee. But we want to go and say the joke and say, no, oh, she's trying to get money. She got $2.9 million. She must be happy. She received less than $500,000 of it, first of all. Do you know where they got that outrageous sum of $2.9 million? Days of process. The juries calculated how much coffee was sold for two days. No Big Macs, no Chicken McNuggets, no McRibs, just coffee for two days. They gave her those profits, which happened to be $2.9 million. So this is supposed to be one of those eye-openers where we go and say, that's how misrepresentation happens. It doesn't just happen to us. We're not always the victim of it. Sometimes we keep it going and say, you know, because we don't have all the facts of something someone else's life. And we need to understand those perceptions and stuff, you know, can be shifted, can be changed. And we need to know how to start changing the perceptions of us being hackers, being security professionals. I love being a hacker. I think hackers are a great thing to be. But, I mean, one of the greatest moments I had was that I was uh, in my daughter's school. She's eight years old, going into her school. And she sees one of her friends and stuff, you know, and, she, and I'm holding her hand. And, she's, and she goes to him and like, that's my daddy. He's a hacker. <laughs> that was awesome. It was a lot better than the embarrassing time she had when she was in the school bus and she told him that I was a ninja. And they explained to her that that couldn't be true because I used to always tell her I was a ninja. And it's like, I always would do something. I was like, team ninja. And she's like, so they thought I was actually a ninja for a while. It was an awesome time, but it's gone now. And it's like, uh, so I'm no longer a ninja, but I could always still be a hacker. Um, so what we need to do is we need to start shifting that perception. We've got a good start of it. We got Dave Kennedy, Wancy, Bill Gardner. It's like Evan Booth and Dan Kaminsky. They're trying to bring logic into the discourse on the media. They're trying to actually inform the public on how it's done. One of the best moments, I think, in TV history and stuff when it involved hackers is the fact when um, Dave Kennedy was on the Katie Couric show and that lady in the audience is like, oh yeah, I'm totally patched, I'm on a Mac, I should be okay and stuff, you know, it's like, I don't have to worry about it. And Dave Kennedy's like, oh really? Well, you know, you already agreed for us to be able to look at that stuff, right? Here's you in your living room on your webcam. <laughs> Here's all your emails, here's all your other stuff. And the look on that poor lady's face, like, my world is not as safe as I thought it was, <laughs> was beautiful. Not because it showed her in a bad light. It was beautiful because it showed people a real world thing that they could understand why security is important. He did a great job on educating, not by telling them what was wrong, not by trying to tell them, but through my knowledge, this is how it happens. He showed them by example the dangers, and that's how they learned. He showed them by example of what could actually happen, and that's why it was a great moment. But why not you? I just got an email today from someone, and stuff you know, who wanted to talk about the Kevin Durant story, and stuff you know about his iPhone being hacked, local television station in Oklahoma. It's like I immediately referred them, replied back to the email, referred them to another guy that I know who's more uh, educated and stuff, you know, on telephone hacking, and said, call, contact this guy. Get the information out there. If you see a local news story or you hear something in the news about a local <coughs> breach or something that's going on, like the target breach, why don't you call your local news station and try to give them the proper information? You're not pimping yourself out and trying to, like, you know, I'm trying to fame monger and stuff, you know. And, and get a, no, you're trying to educate the community. You should be contacting your local news station. You should be contacting the newspaper if you have a good detailed analysis of what that's about and to try to get that information out there. Because I promise you, if educated people like you are not giving that information out, other people will. And that's not a good thing for anybody. Okay, except for that guy. And he's, like, and he's a jerk and I'll never, you know, let people forget about it. Um, but, um, so we got to do more. We got to do that, okay? Now, another problem is, when you talk about hackers, is there are some other things you don't know about hackers. Do you realize the blood code event at DEFCON 
a scary hacker convention that had war games and lockpick pavilions. They had a blood drive there. It started out because one of their own, who was for one day, it's like a, when he was still in the, the throes of uh, needing blood transfusions, we brought the lady to tears. The lady was heading up the blood drive from the blood bank. Because within the first hour, the whole day was signed up, and she had to spend the rest of the day turning people away. She was in tears by the time it was over. She had never seen that anywhere before at any conference or any conference. Because a lot of other conferences have done blood drives in Vegas. I mean, it's Vegas. There's everything done in Vegas. It's like, but there's also blood drives done at the conferences. And she's like, this is the first one that just left her speechless. The second year, we were a little bit more organized. They understood what was going on. We did it for two days. The biggest blood drive in Nevada history happened that one. On the third one, and that was because also the ninja was throwing their last party and stuff, you know, they're giving out invites. I think that helped a little bit, okay? <laughs> I'm being honest about it and stuff, you know. It's like I think that so you know what I did last year? No gimmicks. We didn't have a raffle like we did the first year. We didn't have uh, party invites like the second year. We didn't do a thing. We just said show up and donate blood because it's the right thing to do and it's helping out people you're never going to know. Hardly any kind of advertisement to it or anything. It was the second largest blood drive in Nevada history. That's how that works yes. when hackers want to do something good. There's a rumor I heard that when you went to go donate blood to the black coat, they would not take it because it was just diet coke and coke. That was no, no, actually, no, you want to know the story? I'll tell you this. I, I actually, you want to actually the story? When I heard about um, blood code, uh, barcode, that he needed the transfusion, I immediately went to the blood bank in Oklahoma to donate because since I had cancer and stuff, they wouldn't let me do it. And so I basically started Blood Code because I said, well, screw it. If I can't donate, I'll get as many other people as I can to donate for me. So that's how Blood Code actually started was because of the fact that it's like I couldn't donate and stuff, you know. But it wasn't for the diet Pepsi. <laughs> because if you do cut me, I fizz. And then that could be a problem. Uh, but, yeah, that's how that started. And what about Johnny Long? Hackers for Charity. He's a Christian missionary that does technological support for a lot of other missions that are in Uganda. He helps schools, he helps build out uh, cafes, he helps educate people and stuff, you know, that's an agro-based economy and stuff, you know, to be more technical, to try to get technical experience and try to be technical-based and stuff, you know, in their, in their jobs. He's doing a valuable service there. And he's doing it mostly, you know, it's like through the support of others, other hackers. So that's another thing. So we've talked about perceptions of hackers. We talked about how the uh, perception of hackers, and this is where I do this transition, and like I said, I just made this slide, I just added some slides this morning, uh, so I don't know how to do the proper transition, but we're gonna transition now to, why do we perceive on religion? It's like, we know how hackers are perceived and how that perception is wrong. Can we be wrong about other perceptions? When I say Islamic and stuff, you know, when I say Muslim, unfortunately a lot of people in the West, that's what they see, that upper right-hand corner. That's the immediate thought they think about, Islamic terrorist. When I was homeless, living behind a dumpster, when I ran away from home, it was a Muslim man that kept me alive, that fed me and stuff. He owned a pizza place, which is where I started probably liking all the pizza. But he kept me alive during that time period. It wasn't my people that I knew from church that knew I was going through some times. It was the Muslim guy who helped me out. Do you know what this bottom picture is? Is that a protest? There was a bombing of a church in New Year's Eve uh, in Egypt a couple years ago. And they celebrate Christmas as Coptic Christians, so they celebrate Christmas in January. So after the New Year's Eve bombing happened, Muslims from all over the country formed rings around the churches during the Mass, the Christmas Mass, so the Christians could have uh, their Christmas Mass uninterrupted. Not just in the big churches, all over. The president's sons stood in line next to everybody else. TV stars, Muslim TV stars and, the and news reporters from those stations formed a human ring to protect uh, those churches. During Tahrir Square, January 25th, Christians formed a ring around the Muslims while they did their midday prayers to keep them from being attacked by the militia. We don't hear about those stories. That doesn't mean they don't occur. It just means we need to broaden our perception. 
because we have a perception problem sometimes too. It's like we got the perceptions here of the KKK in Westboro Baptist Church. I tell you, I don't know about you, but I honestly, one of my biggest dreams is to just deliver, hand deliver, because I want to see the reaction of a big map of the world and just point out the Bible happened here and show them Africa and the Middle East and stuff, you know. That's where, what shade of people do you think were living in those regions back in BC times? I just want to deliver them to every single KKK person I know. It's like, you know, it's like, I don't know anything, goodness, but, you know, it's like, I just like, it's like, do you understand that this is where these people come from? It's like, so why are you so you're just ignorant? What about this guy, though? Did we hear about this guy? A lady in some northern state said that she was uh, not given a tip by family because of her lifestyle. It turns out she lied about it. But what did that lie accomplish? That lie accomplished these guys who formed a group called Tip for Jesus to leave $1,000, $10,000, $3,000, hundreds of dollar tips for waiters in the name of Jesus. Out of that despicable act, that created that movement. Once again, they didn't talk about what should be done. They did something. You know, there is a great function, and I've always I've said this, and I have stood in line. Uh, I, I've stood in a silent wall and stuff, you know, when Westboro Baptist Church was picketing a funeral and stuff, you know, uh, in Oklahoma. I was there at one of those lines. And I will tell you, Westboro Baptist Church has a function. Because it's usually when we see evil, we act. It helps motivate people to actually take a conscious effort saying, this is wrong, I want to do something about it. I'm sure that's not what they intend, and I don't care, but I like it. Because it does show people that there are more people that are trying to do good than there are trying to do bad. And that's something that we keep forgetting in this world, that there are more people trying to do good than there are trying to do bad. We have to keep remembering that we're not alone. This is actually a very sad slide. Because the saddest part about this whole slide is the Pope is doing awesome. He is creating so much conversation now about Christianity and what it means to be a Christian. In the news, and in, I mean, I've seen in different circles people talk about, that Pope, he's a really good guy. That guy, is, I mean, that is a good guy. I'm an atheist, but he's doing really good work. And the sad part about that whole thing is, it's not because he's doing something different. He's doing what he's, everybody should be doing in the first place. It is sad that a Pope driving a Ford Focus instead of the Bentley that was custom made for him, that a pope is actually going and disguising himself as a regular priest and feeding the homeless like we should be doing. A pope that actually puts in to work what he says from the pulpit causes this much stirring uh, and this much, you know, talk and this much, you know, reporting. The pope is getting all this attention and his time person of the year because of the fact he's showing with words what a, a Christian is. It's like, and to me, that is humbling. It's like, and it's beautiful and it's awesome, but it's sort of sad that we're so excited about seeing someone do something that everybody should be doing anyway. So what about perceptions of Christian hackers? <laughs> what perception? <laughs> it's like, we're, hackers are in a culture that people look at, you know, shifty and shady anyway, okay? And the whole thing is, if you were born, if you were raised and being a hacker, stuff, you know, you've always had that gene. You've always had people looking down at you. You've always been not one of the cool kids. You've always been part of that little clique. So now, being a Christian in that clique, where everybody else is used to being judged, everybody people used to looking down on, how do you come in as a Christian and stuff, you know, and say, well, yeah, but this is how I am, and say, you know, and then automatically you're judging me. Oh, you're trying to say that you're better than me and stuff. You know, you're trying to say that you're that you're doing something right and I'm doing something wrong. Very defensive because you know we're hackers. That's what we're used to getting, right? It's usually the negative. It's a negative based, you know, scene in your community mostly. Everybody's looking at the bad things that happen. When I was working at um, when I was working on the gang task force, it's like I tell people, it's like I have a lot of good stories. I have no good memories. It's like because you're used to all those things that are happening. It's like the same thing in hacking. We're always looking at the worst case scenario of what goes on. It's like you get that. It's like because you don't want to be told 
what you're doing wrong. So why do we have to tell people what they're doing wrong to be a good Christian? I honestly, and so you know, some may agree, but I honestly I say you don't. I look at the, the, the life of Jesus. How many times did Jesus go out to a place to, to testify to them, to, to, to preach to them, to sermon them, and stuff, you know, and just give them an agenda? And how many times did he just do something different that made people question him? How many times did he do something that made people go and say, hey, I don't think you're supposed to be doing it that way, which created an opportunity for him to teach? which created him an opportunity for him to show by example of why he's doing this thing this way. It's like, and I'm going to share a story because I always believe it's like, uh, I, I'm one of the perfect examples of how not to do a lot of things. So it's like, uh, so I like to share my failures. And so I'll start off with my biggest failure stuff, you know, in Christianity and stuff, you know, in my, my walk is when I first became a religious person. And I denoted that way because that's exactly what I was. Back in the eighth grade, it's like I had a little gold pendant that said Jesus loves you, and I carried my Bible to school, and it's like, and I was like at the Christian Student Union and stuff, you know, and I was just all about the word and all about, you know, the proper stuff. I was projecting so much about how I'm a good Christian. This is the way it's supposed to be. So, you know, I didn't really think back, back then, and I can look at it now and say, it's like back then I didn't understand what Christianity was. I didn't understand what my faith was. I just understood I wanted to be somebody different. And so this was the person I was going to be. So I did that, and I got mocked mercilessly from especially this group of kids in the math class and stuff, you know, which I still don't like, and I'm okay with that. It's like uh, they were horrible to me. They would make fun of me because I didn't drink, I didn't smoke. They didn't make fun of me because I didn't cuss. They made fun of me because I, the way I looked. They made fun of my necklace. They made fun of my Bible. They made fun of me, all this different stuff. And I didn't like that, you know. It didn't make me happy. It's like I had a sad. I said, you know, but you know what else happened? During the summer, between the 8th and 9th grade, I went on a uh, Sunday school Bible mission kind of thing. I don't know what it was. I remember we had to go to this other church. We went to this other church, and there in the choir, singing to me from the audience, were those kids who gave me all that crap. I didn't have faith. I had a rigid shell and stuff, you know, and I had, a, I had planted an oak of what my faith was. And so guess what it did? It snapped. Screw this. This is what you call God. This is what you call religion. This is what you call uh, Christianity. It's like these kind of hypocrites. I don't need this crap. And so guess what happened? In ninth grade, all I did was wear black. I had death poetry. And I was all depressed and stuff, you know. It was like... I, I, I tell myself I was a hipster goth because because this was back in the 80s. This was before goth. I was like a goth before it was cool or weird and, and still, you know, in the hot topic. So it's like, so yeah, so it's like I was a hipster goth and stuff. You know, I wore all my black and stuff. You know, I was a, and guess what happened? All those kids accepted me. No, they mocked me. They called me the son of Satan. They made fun of me. They, they said all those other The same kids that were mocking me for my faith were mocking me for what I looked like. In other words, I'm just a guy easy to be mocked, okay? And I, I just had to learn to come to grips with that. And I'm okay with that, okay? I'm okay with it now. So then I survived the ninth grade. It's like I barely survived the 10th. It's like uh, don't even finish the 11th and stuff, you know? And then I'm out on the world. It wasn't until I would say around 20, 21 or something like that, where I started developing a faith, a relationship with God. I stopped looking for something to boost me up and create a shell that I could protect myself with and started creating a relationship with someone that I could talk to and be with during my times of trials and the times of trouble and the times of happiness. And that's when it changed. And I learned from then, and I started working with a, a, a youth group and an outreach program and stuff, you know, for uh, homeless kids. It's like, and I think uh, up until the building was probably destroyed, it's like my poem was on the wall and stuff, you know, that church, uh, the outreach center. Because I wrote a lot of Christian poetry. It's still out there on the internet if you can find it good enough. It's like, uh, and it's like, and what I've done is, is that I started teaching people not by, this is how you should do it. I just started living my life. I started wanting, if, I know we're supposed to use a Bible quote, so let's go with Galatians and stuff, you know. 
know me by my fruit. It's like, know me by what I do. It's like, know me by, and question me on that. I've had, I used to go to a poetry reading place uh, back at, uh, in Houston, downtown grounds and stuff, you know, coffee shop. There was like Wiccans and Satanists and atheists and all these different weird, you know, artsy, you know, religion du jour people and stuff, you know, with their belief systems. And I would read my Christian poetry there. But the whole thing is I wasn't judging anybody by theirs. Some of them did some pretty awesome poetry. It was great poetry. But then I would get up there and do mine. And it was funny to see some of them who were intolerant of me reciting my poetry when I was trying to explain to them, it's like, no, the whole thing is about tolerance. I don't have to agree with what you do. I'm not trying to change you. I can't change people. You can't change a hacker and believing in Jesus Christ. You can't do that. You can lead by example. You can give them a way to say, this is how I live my life. Are you interested in learning a little bit more about it? Show them a path and see if they want to get on that. That's God's choice and God's direction and stuff, you know, of giving them uh, to put on that path. I was talking to someone recently who was in a very depressed state and said, you know, they weren't feeling very well. And I told them, look, dude, you're in a dark, lonely tunnel right now. It's like, I can't get you out of that tunnel. Okay, but I want you to understand, I'm going through some hard times right now. Why don't you hold my hand because I'm in that same tunnel with you. It's like, and you're not alone in that tunnel. And with Jesus Christ, I'm never alone in that tunnel, ever. That's what I have, that assurance. I have a conviction, not a, you know, belief system. It's like, I have the full faith that I know where I'm going and I know who's with me. I can't recite Bible quote after Bible quote and try to teach people stuff. What I can do is what I believe is right. What I believe God wants me to do. What I can do is I can profess when questioned my faith. My faith does not mirror a lot of, you know, top religious leaders and stuff in mainstream Christianity right now. I've done Twitter rants on that. I'm unashamed of that fact. Because my core beliefs are that I am a, a child of God, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, as like, and I go by his commandments. And his second commandment was to treat others in a nice way. See, once again, I'm not doing the quotes. But it's like, it was still, that's what it was. It's like, hackers want to hear not about what they're doing wrong. They want to see what you're doing right. And that's the reason why I'm still a hypocrite, because I'm not perfect. It's like, I still make mistakes. But once again, even with those mistakes, I'm still forgiven. And I still find redemption, and I still seek it. So I think through the whole thing that I wanted to get through, because I'm rambling a lot more now at this point, so you know, but this, the key thing is we have to stop trying to show people what they're doing wrong. You know, it's like in, in this industry, that's pretty hard because that's our whole job, right? We go to the conference and go, boom, exploit, zero day, they're owned. You know, oh, breach, target, oh my gosh, you've got to be kidding me. We're so busy telling everybody what goes wrong that we're not really good on that whole, good job. You know, y'all see that movie Hancock and stuff, you know? It's like, good, good job. You know, it's like it's so difficult to be able to say, you know, good job. You know, you're doing good. It's like, but that's one of the problems we have. It's like, how do we do that? And my whole thing is, and the way that I lead my life and stuff, you know, is I lead testimony by not testifying. It's like I pick people up off the side of the road because they need help. It's like I go and I help other people and stuff when they need it. I will listen to people off channel and stuff when they have issues. And I don't discuss it. I just do it. Because in that one person's life, I've made an impact. I'm not going to impact the world with my faith. I don't need to. Someone's already done that. And he did a really good job of it, you know, after he came back to life. And so, you know, made an impact. I'm not going to do that ever. But I'm going to impact this one person. You ever see that movie with Eddie Murphy? So, you know, I watch a lot of movies, as you can tell. With the, when he was on the shopping channel. And he told a story about the girl on the beach with the starfish. There are all these starfish that have washed up to shore. And she was frantically throwing them back into the ocean to try to save them. And the guy goes up to her and he's like, what are you doing? You can't help these. It's like, it's a lost cause. And then she picks up a starfish and throws them into the water. She says, yeah, but to that one, 
it made all the difference. And that's how we do it. We try to impact lives at a time. And we witness not by what we say, but what we do. So my whole biggest thing out there is to just go out there and testify by your life and stuff you know, not by your tweets. And we'll end it there because, you know, I'm thirsty. <laughs> That was probably a lot quicker too than I thought. Huh? A little short of time, but if there are any questions for Jason or for the crowd, then feel free to ask. It's a time of discussion. So it will take about five, ten minutes to discuss. Full well knowing, I probably won't have any good answers for you, but you know, why not? Jason, what's it like before you now? Obviously, you're, you're pretty uh, uh, prolific. I would say prolific in the community, right? Our, it's our eco chamber, right? And, right. Um, just any any feedback, encouragement you could share with us on on either uh, differences that your your uh, faith has made and either developing relationships or maybe some of the the bad things that, that you've had to pursue. I think it's like I always try to focus on the good stuff. I I've never been. There are a couple of hackers that I know that are very atheist and stuff. You know, and it's like anybody who says atheist isn't a religion is just. It's just, um, it's just I, I don't understand that because it's like it is a religion based on not liking religion and stuff. You know, it's like because they have a faith that no God exists. Right. That is their faith and stuff. You know, it's like no God, and it's not that no God, exists, but we have to make sure that you understand that no God exists. It's like I have no problem with people not wanting to, to believe in God. I have no problem with people not. Wanting, my wife's agnostic and stuff. You know, it's like I'm okay with that. Okay, because they're not living by my rules and stuff. You know, it doesn't mean I have to make them. So it's like, but even to some of those atheists who, who give me a couple of slides every once in a while, so, you know, it doesn't matter and stuff, you know, it's like, because it's about how I respond. They get that, because how, I had one guy at Downtown Grounds actually at the poetry reading, so, you know, I sat down for this one guy who was like a hardcore atheist guy and stuff, you know, had the black eyeliner and all that stuff, you know, it was just really bad fashion choices, in my opinion. It's like, uh, he was a good guy and stuff, you know, I just didn't like the way he dressed and stuff, you know, it's like I would have dressed way better in that outfit. It's like, uh, but yeah, it's like, the whole thing was, is that we had a conversation for over an hour. Never, ever, did I was telling him something was wrong, I was telling him about my belief, and he was, he told me, he's like, dude, I wish I would have met you five years ago. It's like, my whole viewpoint would have changed, I would have been like, I probably would have gone, I was like, but dude, talking to you now. <laughs> it's not like interchangeable. You're not like locked and stuff, you know. This isn't like insurance and stuff, you know. You're not locked forever and stuff, you know. You can, you can actually change. It's a little bit easier to change and stuff, you know. It's like you can change that opinion. You can change that walk you're doing. And so, and so I think that's one of the key things. It's like, it's like um, yeah, there are some hackers out there that are just very, very atheist and they're like very proud of their atheism and they're very proud of the fact that they can do that. And that's fine. It's like, I have no problem with anybody else who wants, the whole basis to me, my whole philosophy is the whole basis of Christianity was founded on choice. How can you be a Christian and deny choice to someone? It's like the whole basis is, do you accept God or not? Not do you. I mean, that went out and stuff, you know, during the Inquisition. So we're not going that route anymore. We've changed. So it's like, start understanding that people can respect other people's choices, but just let them know that's not mine. And show them why it's not yours. So it's like so. And I've had other positive experiences. I have once. I've had times where some people come up to me and go like, "I know you're a Christian," and I'm like, "Well, that's sort of sad." <laughs> it's like obviously I'm not. Like I said, I'm not doing the biggest walk either. It's like, but once again, I try to keep my walk very private until someone questions me. It's like, and that's just the way I roll. That's not for everybody, okay? But that's how I am. I keep my faith very quiet. So you know, but when I'm asked. I don't hesitate. When people question me about it, it's like, I don't hesitate. I've gone out on Twitter and stuff, you know, and created these big screeds and stuff about religious stuff, you know, talking about my Christianity, talking about my faith. I don't hide it under a bushel. But like I said, I'd rather have people come up to me and question because those are the ones that are looking for answers. And those are the ones that I'm more likely to change. It's like, and that's, the, and that's the way I usually run it and stuff, you know. So it's like in the hacking community, so, like at DerbyCon. DerbyCon, um, I have a interfaith breakfast. I don't have a Christian fellowship breakfast. I have an interfaith breakfast. We've had a Buddhist there before. We've had an agnostic person there, a Celtic person there. It's like everybody goes there and just talks about their faith. 
no one's trying to convert anybody. No one's trying to witness. It's just, tell me about your faith. Tell me about your path. I'll just tell you about my path and stuff, you know. And we're not, we're not comparing, you know, gods. And we're not comparing, you know, religions like, yeah, but my guy wants me to do this, this, and this. Is your God you do that? No. Sorry. You know, it's not like that. So it's like, and that's one of the things that we start out by just accepting. You're not going to change everybody. It's not your job to do it. That's God's job is to put them in your path so you can show them and witness to them. And so, you know, and where it goes from there is between them and God. Okay, we're done. It's actually good that you talk about the distinction between atheism and agnosticism. One of the things that we notice in the information security and IT community is more so, they're not as much atheists as much as they are agnostics. And they, because of the quest of knowledge, right? And if you go back to look at it, um, they want rational and evidence behind the faith that, that uh, we, we have. And so it takes time, and I think what we said that for example, Oops. Sorry. Right, we started uh, in the last two years that we had almost so sort of eight men that come to me every now and then. And one of the guys was a very well known professional, I won't mention his name, but extremely when he talks, you know, at Black Hat, the the, the, the last session for fill up, he sent a note saying, I find you extremely offensive for what you've done with the security community here at Black Former. And I responded back saying, if there's anything personally I offended you, please, you know, I apologize for that. But it was only on the grounds of faith, and there's nothing that I had more to add to say. Uh, but what did make a difference is at Black Hat, I ran into him, and the first thing I did, he tried to avoid me, but I reached over to him, pulled him, and gave him a hug. And I said, he, it, was, it was an awkward hug. I was like, that's an awkward hug right there. That qualifies. <laughs> but it did, it did change the perception, though. It did. So the power of perception is so appropriate, I think, as well as to be able to lead as Jesus did by, by his walk than just by talking. And not necessarily talk, but uh, always be, you know, be the, the person that he's called us to be. So it's, it's just brilliant that he brings this up. And this gentleman actually had said that he was an agnostic. But what we noticed and what we're starting to see now is that. Uh, he's starting to open up to, to, to even hear us out. So it's, we're not in the mission of converting anyone like uh, Jason put, but he does that as God's work. And all we do is we just point him to the cross, point them to the cross and the way that's being laid. And uh, they choose to go on it, they choose to go on it, but if, you, know, you can't run from God. If God's got somebody in mind, he's the best fisherman and he'll fish you. So, he's got a big net here. God the fisher, maybe that's the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> How's someone do something about fishing, email fishing? And then, oh, hi. <laughs> I like it. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason.